So let's start. Uh, today we have Hilary Hartnett. She is a professor at Arizona State University. And she studies biochemistry, geochemistry, and astrobiology. So today she's going to talk about searching for life in the water worlds. And they may be habitable, but not detectable. What do we do about it? Right? <laughs> People say, I love astrobiology, and another one says, same here. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. So, so I'm excited to be here today, everybody. Um, and as Julia said, we're going to talk about how we will look for life on water worlds. Those are planets with lots and lots of water. And by the end of the story, I think what you may realize is that these planets might be perfectly habitable beautiful oceans, lots of light, plankton could grow and be really happy, but it might be very hard for us to detect life on those planets. And so let's, let's get started. Um, so who am I? Well, I'm actually kind of hard to describe. I'm an oceanographer. I went to graduate school and I got a PhD in oceanography. And so I study uh, the sediments at the bottom of the ocean and the chemistry of the water columns. And these days I'm at a university in a desert um, and I do a lot more work in aquatic systems on land. Um, so this is me uh, actually in northern Mexico in this valley where the water only uh, runs down the mountains and into the center of this valley so uh, it doesn't have uh, doesn't have a lot of access to other regions. And so these, these lakes are sort of unique. Uh, this is me uh, sampling a hot spring next to a river in Indonesia. Um, and so hot springs are interesting for astrobiology because organisms that live at high temperature or what we call extremophiles, things that love extreme conditions, uh, might be interesting for life on other planets. And I still go to the ocean. This is me just two winters ago uh, in the Indian Ocean collecting sediments in these uh, plastic tubes or cores. Uh, this will go down to the bottom of the ocean. So I have all these tools as a chemist and as a geoscientist who has studied oceans for many, many years. And that sets me up really well to call myself an astrobiologist because I have a really broad background that means I can bring lots of different tools from different pieces of science to ask hard questions. Um, and I'm really interested in what environments might be like on other planets. So that's where I come from. Let's see where we're going. Oh yes, and I have to remember every time I give a talk, I wanna thank the people that help because I don't do this all by myself, right? Um, I'm gonna mention my colleague, Natalie, who's in Texas, who helps me with understanding elements in stars. Um, there are several research groups that all have these alphabet soup names uh, at my university that I'm part of. And this is my research lab. So this is me. And these are all of my students, both undergraduate students who are in college and graduate students who are getting advanced degrees. Um, and one of my students was an exchange student from South Korea. And one of my students, Josh here, just graduated, so he's not in the lab anymore, but he's now, uh, he's actually working at an aquarium in Mississippi as their lead environmental chemist. And my lab is called the Carbon and Nitrogen Dynamics Lab, or Candy Lab. So some of my students have are taking degrees in chemistry some of my students are taking degrees in geology, and one of my students is taking a degree in biology. So there's a big range. So we're, for the talk today, it's in three parts. So the first part, I'm gonna talk about elements, chemical elements in stars and in planets. And so we need to know some chemistry. And the reason for that is that what we're gonna measure in the near-ish future is probably chemistry. 
right? We're not going to see trees and plants and, and, and animals. We're going to measure chemistry. And this right now for planets is a problem that we have really, really limited data, like almost none. In the second part, we're going to talk about ecology. That's a branch of biology that tells us about the properties of living systems. And when I say living systems, I mean both the biology and the environment interacting with each other. And once we've learned a little chemistry and a little biology, we're going to see what that tells us about water worlds and how we might be able to detect or not detect oxygen. And oxygen, the molecule O2, it's what we breathe, right? It's critical for us. And it's made by plants through photosynthesis. And so it's one of the best indicators or what we call biosignatures, right? Sort of like a fingerprint of life for our planet. And so we're hoping that it will be useful for other planets. So the first message, we don't know hardly anything about phosphorus, the element phosphorus in stars and planets. And phosphorus is really important for biology. And yes, other elements are important too, but this is mostly a story about phosphorus. It's a sort of like the fertilizer that we put in our gardens. So plants really need it. And the second message is for exoplanets, if we can detect the water, it's probably too much water. And that is not what you would expect. It's what we call counterintuitive. Our expectation is that water is great. And I'm gonna tell you that too much water might be a problem. So is everybody ready? Okay, part one, elements in stars and planets. So I'm gonna assume that you guys know that there are lots and lots and lots of exoplanets. Exoplanets are planets around other stars. And this is kind of an old animation. It's from the Kepler data. Kepler was a satellite that measured exoplanets. And it's a sort of art artist cartoon of different planets going around their suns. And you can see that there are lots and lots of stars with planets, right? Some of them, the planets are really close to the star. Some of them, the planets are really far away from the star. The colors here tell us whether the planets are hot or cold, but really this is just to remind us all, there are lots of planets. You look up into the sky and now we're starting to believe that most stars have them. We just haven't looked at them yet, right? And so planets are common. Well, if planets are common and we live on a planet and we know there are other planets in our own solar system, we ask really obvious questions like, is there life on other planets? In our own solar system, we might be unique, right? It's pretty sure that there's no life on Jupiter and Saturn and the other gas giants. And Mercury's really hot. Mars and Venus are a little tricky, but so far we haven't found anything. But what about a planet around another star? Well, whoops. This is a hard, hard problem. They're really, really far away. We might know how much they weigh, their mass, and we might know how big they are, their radius. That's all we know. So the only thing we know about these planets is their size and how close to their star they are. So it means we can ask questions about what are those planets like, and we don't have hardly any way to tell if we're right or wrong. So we have to start to look to some of uh, what we know from physics and what we know from our own solar system. And this starts to be really exciting when people find stuff about a planet that they've never seen before. So recently, well, not so recently for you guys, it was last year, uh, there was a planet in the news called K218b. And planets all have these names that are sort of hard to pay, hard to figure out because they're named for their star and they're numbered. And there was a news piece that said, first water detected on a habitable planet. Whoa. So a habitable planet is one that's close enough to its sun that its temperature is going to be okay. And it could have liquid water. And this was measured in its atmosphere, really tiny signal of water vapor. And everybody got really excited and said, water on a habitable planet. Well, and this is an artist's rendition of a planet. But wait, that planet has a density 
it's mass per unit volume, so how much stuff in how much space, of about three, maybe as high as four. Well, Earth's density is closer to six. So that's not very dense. That means this planet might actually be more like a gas giant with a thick atmosphere than like a rocky planet with water. And we don't know. So this news article said, oh, a super Earth with habitable temperatures. Well, that's great for the news part of it. But with a density of three, it's a pretty sad super Earth, right? It's not going to be all that habitable. Um, but it might be a great mini Neptune. It might be a fine little gas giant. And that's OK, right? It's perfectly exciting to say, oh, there's a gas giant with water in its atmosphere. So exoplanets and astrobiology doesn't always have to be about life, right? We're starting to know enough about planets that just studying rocky planets and gassy planets and watery planets is going to be super interesting. So be careful what you read in the news, right? Talk to the scientists because it doesn't matter that it's not a super Earth. It's pretty exciting that it's a planet with water. So I've used the word habitable, and I may have used the word habitable zone. It's the region around a star where you can have liquid water. So here's our sun, and this is the orbit of Mercury and Venus, Earth, and Mars getting farther and farther away. And the habitable zone is this green band. So Mercury is too close. There's no liquid water because it's too warm. Earth is pretty much in the middle. Venus is probably on the edge of the habitable zone. It could have water, but it's usually too hot. And it's got such a greenhouse effect that it's way too warm. And Mars maybe had liquid water in its early times, but now is too cold and the water has escaped. So if it was just the habitable zone, then we could pick out planets that should be habitable, no problem. But it's not just the habitable zone. And it's interesting because Mars should have water, right? It's in the habitable zone, but Mars's water is really, really hard to find. It's in ice, it's really deep, and there's not a lot of it. So just being close together doesn't necessarily mean that water will be there. It has a lot to do with how a planet forms. What's the environment where that material condenses to make a solid planet? And habitable zone isn't the whole picture. What that planet is made of matters a lot. What are the elements? Detecting life is going to depend on having the right elements and on whether the processes that life goes through, right? Just like we breathe, take a deep breath. That's, uh, that breath probably came from plants on land. Take another breath. That breath definitely came from plants in the ocean. About half our oxygen is from plankton in the ocean. And the rate at which oxygen is produced is something that we can think about as being a signature for life. So what do we know about habitability in our own solar system, right? Our own planet, our own planets. The rocky planets are habitable sometimes, right? Earth is definitely habitable, more or less. Um, but Venus and Mars, they have some temperature issues. Our gas giants, trickier to say if they're habitable, certainly in their interiors, the pressure is extremely high. Um, and while one could argue that maybe there's the capacity to do stuff in the atmosphere, in the near term, right, in my lifetime, maybe even in your lifetime, I believe that we should be looking for life like we have on Earth, because we know what it does. We know how to look for it. It doesn't mean that other kinds of life don't exist, but we don't currently have any, even any theory about what that might look like. So for my career, I'm focusing on how are we going to detect life as we know it, because at least we know what to look for. So as we get more and more data and as we learn things and we get new theories, we can probably expand that. Our icy bodies, for instance, like the moons around Jupiter and uh, Saturn, they may be habitable. 
they don't have liquid water at the surface, right? They're outside that zone. But if they have hydrothermal systems below their oceans where there's heat from the planet, they are, it's possible that there could be life in those oceans under the ice. Um, and another part of my research, which I won't get to so much today, is about that. And so for exoplanets, we don't really know exactly what we're going to see. And if we don't have an example of a particular type of planet in our own solar system, it's hard to, be, hard to make a guess, right? So we know we have icy bodies, we know we have gas giants, and we have rocky planets with greater and lesser amounts of water. So for planets around other stars, our first step is to say, okay, well, what do their stars look like? We can see the stars. We can do chemistry for the stars. Um, and to do that, my colleague Natalie, remember I mentioned her at the beginning, she's built a catalog of all of the element abundances, the measured amounts of sulfur and nitrogen and carbon and helium and neon and all the elements you can imagine in stars. And this catalog is online. You can go and look at it and you can ask what the composition of stars are. And this is a summary. You don't have to know every piece of information in this table. It's a bar chart and on the bottom, are all the elements that have been measured in stars. And it's about 73 of the, of the elements. And there's about 6,000 stars in the catalog. PC is a part, sorry about that. These are stars that are pretty to us. Um, and that's because of the chemical abundance measurements require what we call high precision and high resolution measurements. And so you have to do it on fairly close by stars. And the height of each bar is the number of stars that have measured that element. So for example, magnesium and silicon and calcium, these are elements that make up rocks. There are 5,297 stars with magnesium data, 5,447 stars with calcium. These are things that get measured pretty easily. And so we have a lot of data. But for elements that are important for biology, carbon and nitrogen and phosphorus, it's sort of a mixed bag. There are 4,405 stars with carbon data. That's pretty good. Nitrogen, about 1,500 stars. Poor phosphorus, there's only 92 stars in the entire catalog, right? That's, you know, not very many, a tiny fraction with phosphorus. And phosphorus is really, really important. So they measure these stars spec with a spectroscopy, right? They look at the light coming from the star and the, um, the spectrum, essentially the color, is related to the elements that are present. And so the spectrum for iron is different from the spectrum for calcium. And they can see these lines in the spectroscopy and they can estimate how much of each element there is in each for, for different stars. Phosphorus is hard because it's measured in the UV, its band is really weak, it's got a shoulder where it runs into the water band, so you can't do it from the surface of the Earth because of our atmosphere. You have to do it from a, from a telescope that's above the atmosphere, or you have to do a lot of fancy computer processing to get that data. It's just harder to measure, and so we don't get much phosphorus data. But these elements are the ingredients for making molecules, right? You want to make a rock, you need to know what elements it has. You want to make a plant, you have to know what elements it has. And it's a lot like baking a cake, right? If you bake a cake, you know you need a certain amount of sugar and butter and chocolate, and flour, and milk. And for this cake, the limiting ingredient might be the eggs, right? The recipe requires two eggs. If you only have one, you could try to make half a cake, but it doesn't work very well, right? The proportions matter. And so you can make a recipe for plankton, right? For, for biology. So the recipe for plankton, they do a process called photosynthesis. They take a carbon dioxide, they need 100 of those more or less, and a nitrate, that's one of the nutrients, they need about 16 of those, and a phosphate, they need one of those for every 16 of the nitrates and every 106 of the carbons in order to do this reaction. And this reaction makes, this is a cartoon approximation of what biomass looks like, but it has the same proportions of carbon to nitrogen to phosphorus as the ingredients. That makes sense. 
And so what we say here is that phosphate is the limiting ingredient because it is the, the one that's present in the least abundance that you have to have in order to make the rest of the um, molecule. And remember I said phosphorus is one of those elements that we don't have very good data for in stars. So now I'm going to show you the star data. And so this is nitrogen and carbon and silicon. These are a bunch of fancy ratios. And the only thing you need to know from this plot is all the circles are the stars. And they live in a big group right about here. And here's plankton with its ratio right here. It doesn't look exactly like the stars. That's cool. And here's the Earth and Mars, and they don't look exactly like the stars either. And our sun kind of sits over here. It's kind of on the edge of what the typical star looks like. And so this is for carbon and silicon where we have a lot of data. We can get kind of an idea of how similar our star is to the, the average star in the catalog and where the planets and life kind of sit out here. But this plot has 1,570 stars in it. Remember, I started about phosphorus. You make this plot with phosphorus, there are only 50 stars that have phosphorus and nitrogen data. Remember, I said there was about 90 with phosphorus, but it's even harder if you want two specific elements together. So now there's only 50 stars. Our sun is still a little weird. That might be useful to know. And here's plankton, and here's Mars, and here's the crust of the Earth. All of these bodies are different because when the planets form, the geological processes separate the elements into different places, right? Our, our, our Earth in the crust has very little phosphorus, right? The carbon to phosphorus ratio is way down here. Um, and most of the phosphorus actually ends up in the core. It wants to bind up with the iron. The plankton are really, really good at using what phosphorus they can get. So the real take home message here is that those elemental ratios are really important for chemical reactions and we need to know them on planets. And we don't have hardly any phosphorus data. We need more phosphorus data and we need new telescopes to do this. And so there's going to be a ton of, of research that needs to be done to build better, better detectors to measure these elements that are important for biology in stars so that we can predict them in planets. And I see a question that says, maybe it's weird because we have more accurate data on our sun. That's a really good sort of hypothesis about it, but it turns out our sun is really hard. It's so close and so bright that it's actually more challenging to make accurate measurements on our own sun. But so first thing to remember is that we need to we need to study elements about biology in stars and there's going to be tons of research to do about that. So part 2 planets and exoplanets and the ecology, how life interacts with its environment. And so this is like a little kid's cartoon that just says there are living things like plants and animals. And there are non-living things like rocks and the air. And organisms don't live in a vacuum, right? You can't think about, uh, you know, the algae that live in the ocean or in a lake without understanding the chemistry of the lake that they live in. You can't think about what plants are doing in a forest without understanding uh, the soils and the rocks that those forests grow on. And this is not a new idea. Here's my pictures of old white guys. Um, this is Charles Lyell. He was a geologist and he wrote a book called Principles of Geology in the 17, late 17, eight, early 1800s. And he was good friends with Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin, who was on the voyage of the Beagle, who wrote The Origin of Species, which is the sort of early ideas about evolution and biology. And the rumor is that Darwin took Lyle's book with him on the Beagle. And if you look at Charles Darwin's notebooks, he has beautiful maps of the geology of the regions that he was studying. And he knew that when he was looking at different adaptations in birds and, and organisms, that it was related to the environment they lived in. 
So I think when we look at planets, we have to think about the whole planet as one system. And that's a big idea. This is uh, something we do in the lab with our students. It's called a Winogradsky column. Winogradsky was a Russian scientist. And this thing, you build it up, it's got dirt in the bottom and water on the top. And at the top, you might have organisms that can do photosynthesis, right? They use light. And in the sediments, you might have organisms that use the oxygen from the photosynthesis to respire. And as you go down in the, in the dirt, you get to organisms that use other chemical species to respire because they actually are poisoned by oxygen. And so there's a whole slew of different metabolisms, right, life processes in this one system. And this is built in a two liter soda bottle. It's not fancy. This one doesn't have a top, but if it had a top, you could measure the amount of oxygen or the amount of CO2, and it would be a integrated sort of measure of everything happening in that bottle including any non-biological processes. And so you can imagine, like our exoplanet, if we could measure something in its atmosphere, we would have to interpret it as a measure of all the different things that are happening in that planet. And when I say non-biological processes, I mean things like, what do volcanoes do? What do rock reactions do at the seafloor that happens down here by this hydrothermal vent? what happens when you weather the surfaces of mountains and then the biology, right? So you need to have people who understand all the geochemical processes, all of the geology processes and the biology. So here's a question for you guys. What types of scientists do we need to study exoplanets? What do you think? Oh, okay, all types. Good. <laughs> I was thinking you were going to give me specific examples. <laughs> Astrobiologists, good. That's exactly right. Astronomers, physicists, astrobiologists, geologists, people who study other kinds of planets, geochemists, oceanographers, all scientists. And it's because when we think about an exoplanet, we can't think about it just as a rock around the sun, or just as a biological system. Exoplanetologists, exactly. And that means if you're interested in biology, there's a place for you in exoplanets and astrobiology. And if you're interested in physics, there's a place for you in this science. And if you're really a chemist at heart, we absolutely have to understand the chemical reactions that are going on, because the signal we're gonna see is not like a tree, it's gonna be the oxygen that those trees produced or that those plankton produced. So does exoplanetology exist? It absolutely does. We're writing a book right now called Planetary Diversity and it's about a new field called comparative planetology. So biosignatures. Say a gas like oxygen, this is a quote from a guy named Mustard for it to be a biosignature, we have to not only know that it comes from biology, right, that life made it, but we also have to know that it didn't get made by some geology process, right? So it has to be made by life, and we have to be sure that it's not made by, say, geochemistry. And that's a pretty tough barrier. Um, and actually, this is from a paper that's about... Uh, I guess it's seven years old at this stage, but it's still a really important idea. And so we have dreamed up, tried out this math equation called the detectability index that says, we want to know the likelihood that, a, say, oxygen comes from a biological source, say plankton, divided by the amount of oxygen that comes from non-biological sources. And there are non-biological sources of oxygen. It turns out ultraviolet light from a sun can beat down on the planet and break water molecules apart. And when, and it's called photolysis, photo meaning light, lysis meaning to break. Um, photolysis will make oxygen and hydrogen in the atmosphere of a planet. If the biolog biological source is bigger, right, then this number becomes a positive number, right? It's the log of a ratio so that we can have a range of values to compare. 
But if you have a lot of biology and not very much of this abiological or non-biological stuff, this will be a big positive number. But if these two numbers are about the same size, well, then this, this value becomes a number close to zero. And if the non-biological source is bigger, then what happens to this number? Then this becomes a negative number. And so now we have an index that we can say, is it a big positive number? Is it a number close to zero? Or is it a negative number? And the big positive numbers are an indicator of how likely it is that biology produced a, pro produced a gas. And the negative numbers are an indicator that maybe it was a geochemical process that produced the gas. So water worlds. Water worlds we define as planets that have lots more water than the Earth. And so Earth could be a water world. It has water for sure. Um, but we're going to compare water worlds based on do they have more water than Earth or less water than Earth. And so this is uh, from a paper by Raymond and his colleagues, also about uh, oh, 2004, oh, so, so a lot of years ago now. But the model is still good. Earth-like planets have 1 to 10 oceans, right? Earth has 1. Water-rich planets have 11 to 100 Earth oceans of water. And water worlds have, in this paper, have more than 100 oceans of water. And if you're Mars-like, you have less than one ocean of water. So we're going to compare them um, to whether they have more or less water than the Earth. We know the Earth is habitable. And we imagine that, OK, so these are just surface water oceans. I'm not talking about the water that's inside in the rocks. Um, we could imagine that water worlds would be perfectly habitable, right? They've got liquid water. They could have a sun. If they had nutrients, they could have, they could have plankton. So, and there are planets like this. The TRAPPIST-1 system uh, has uh, seven, seven or eight planets. Some of them are in the habitable zone. And we think that some of them have as much as 15% water by mass. Um, a few of them are lower, more like 1%, but that's a lot of water. Our Earth has a tiny amount of water by mass. Our Earth is 0.02% water by mass. And so these planets have way more water than the Earth. And some of them are going to be cold and frozen, but some of them could have liquid water. And that's pretty exciting, right? Because we know that life on Earth has to have water. Here's an artist's... Uh, idea of what the TRAPPIST 1F might look like. It's a water world. It's close enough that on its daytime side, it has liquid water to its sun. But it's also, it's locked in its orbit. So it's got a permanent day side and a permanent night side. And so this is supposed to look like the permanent night side. Um, but it's pretty weird looking. However, it could have a perfectly happy ocean ecosystem. So let's start with our Earth and use my detectability index to sort of see what we think a planet might look like if it had life. And then I'll compare it to a planet like this. And I realize I'm running a little long, but we're getting, we're getting close to the end here. So life in our ocean, here's the ocean. You don't have to pay too much attention to the chemistry. I'll walk you through it. Here's a continent, right? And so there's photosynthesis and respiration in the ocean. There's weathering on land, which supplies nutrients and sediments to the ocean. And all of this photosynthesis and respiration, which have big fat arrows to remind me to tell you that it is a big number, 10 to the fourth teramoles of oxygen being produced by photosynthesis and consumed by respiration, that leaves a little bit left over to go to the atmosphere, 20 teramoles of oxygen every year. But remember I said photolysis can make oxygen. Ultraviolet light comes in, breaks up the water, makes a little hydrogen and some oxygen, and it only makes something like 0.02 to 2 teramoles per year. So let's walk through that equation. My detectability index is the log of the biological part, that's the 20, divided by the geochemical or physical process that makes oxygen, that's the photolysis, and if you divide 20 by 0.02 and take the log, you get plus 3. That's a pretty big positive number. And we expect that we get a big positive number because this is Earth, right? 
biology produces a lot of oxygen and photolysis produces a tiny amount of oxygen. So we get a big positive number for our detectability of oxygen. But what if we had more water? Now I've raised up my ocean and I've covered up the continent, right? So this is a water world. It only takes five more oceans of water to cover up all the continents on Earth. And that means that this weathering gets decreased a lot because we don't have rivers and we don't have rainfall breaking up rocks and moving nutrients to the ocean. Well, that's a problem. And this gets back to my phosphorus, right? It's one of my favorite elements. Phosphorus is what we call a rock derived element. It comes from the continents. Here's a beautiful picture of the mineral apatite. Usually we don't see it in this nice gem quality uh, color. It's often called Windex apatite because of its blue. And it's a molecule that has calcium and phosphorus and some fluorine. <coughs> and it only comes from rocks. And it turns out these are really stable rocks. They don't dissolve very easily. So the supply is very low, even on our Earth where we have all the continents weathering to make uh, sediments and nutrients that run into the ocean. So on Earth, it's got a tiny little flux, less than one teramol. We calculated for our water world, it's going to be not 0.07, but 0 0.00016. So that's orders of magnitude less phosphorus on my water world because its continents are covered with water. And life needs that phosphorus. So what do you imagine will be the rate of biological processes on a planet that doesn't have enough nutrients? There are some uh, questions. Uh, yeah, so they're going to go down. Chat. Yeah, the rates are going to be lower. And so here's my model. Remember, a model is just a, it's a calculation or a cartoon of how do we understand the way the world works. So now my ocean is still high. My nutrients are lower. I have less oxygen produced, so I made these arrows thinner. And we calculate that now only about 0.02 oxygens are produced by biology. And that's about the same size as the amount from photolysis. So it might still be habitable, but the amount of oxygen you make, what we call the flux, is three or four orders of magnitude smaller. Doesn't mean there's no life. But now, if we want to calculate the likelihood that that's produced by biology, we're going to have a problem. So on the right is my first one for Earth. And remember, we calculated a detectability index of three, a big positive number, because there's way more biological production than photolysis production. But here on the right, my water world, now biology production is way down because there's not enough phosphorus to build that recipe for plankton. And it's about the same size as the rate of photolysis production of oxygen. And now this ratio is about one. Depending on the value you take, you get somewhere between negative one and positive one. The water world, it's not so sure that that life is detectable. It's about, you, you, would, you could measure oxygen, but you might be mistaken if you said it was biology because you get the same amount of oxygen produced by the non-biological process. So the water world might make oxygen, but it might not be made by life. And so if you were to detect oxygen on this water world planet, you would be very careful if you had a press release or a news story, because you might not be sure it's from life. So let's, let's summarize this. That detectability is an important thing, right? We need to be able to measure the biosignature and we need to be able to interpret whether or not that molecule of oxygen is from life or not. So this detectability index, my DI, can help us prioritize which planets oxygen is going to be a good biosignature for. So remember on Earth, where we have one ocean, we got a detectability index of three, and that's a pretty good biosignature. Thanks. Oh, my husband is bringing me more coffee. <laughs> On our pelagic planet, our ocean world with just five oceans, we detected oxygen, but my detectability index comes out as a number about one. So it's only a fair biosignature. 
And while I didn't do the math for you guys, for a water world with say 40 times Earth's ocean, which is more like what the Trappist planets are, that detectability index is way less than one. And so it's probably a pretty poor biosignature. It's that oxygen, if we measure it, is probably from photolysis. So it's not that the water's bad for life, it's just that having so much water actually inhibits a process that's a geological processes that supplies one of the needed elements for life. Um, and this index is really something that works for planets with atmospheres where we're going to measure, say, a gas in the atmosphere. It's a little trickier for planets that have icy, icy mantles. So the take home message is that oxygen might not be such a good indicator for life on a water world because we're not, because the water world is a harder place to know whether or not the geochemical process and the biological process are of the same order or if the biology is bigger. But this is where you guys come in. Future scientists are going to be the people who figure out what to look for on these kinds of planets, right? We know that water worlds are out there. We see the Trappist planets. As we get better and better at measuring what's in their atmospheres, we're gonna need people to think about what should we look for? What will be a better indicator for life? My research sets the stage for this, but this is science that's gonna happen in the next 20 or 30 years when you guys are grown up and practicing scientists. So I am done here with my talk. I'm going to summarize for you and then I'm happy to talk and chat with you guys about anything you thought was cool. So we know almost nothing about phosphorus, the element, in stars and planets. So we need to work on measuring phosphorus. So we can tell if those planets even have the right recipe for life. And too much water on a planet maybe will be a problem for detecting life. It makes it harder to know if life is from if oxygen is made by life or if oxygen is made by just a geochemical process. And so on my water worlds, that phosphorus, it's not supplied by the continents because continents are buried by the ocean. That limits how much oxygen is made. And therefore, I don't think we should focus on the water worlds in terms of life detection. I actually think the important place to look is going to be under the ice mantles of places like Europa and Enceladus. So exoplanets are going to be hard, right? They're super exciting and their science is difficult. And so I hope I also gave you the idea that we need biologists and geochemists and planetary scientists and astrophysicists working together to answer these problems. Thanks. Oh, thank you so much. It was very interesting lots of new thoughts, new ideas. But well, and the questions have been great. Here, here is another question that um, I, I got in private chat. Um, so what's the difference between the water world versus the ice world in terms of phosphorus? Ah, that's a really good question. We don't know yet anything at all about phosphorus in uh, the icy bodies. We, for our own solar system, right, Enceladus and Europa, places like that, we do know that most of the rocky objects, they all condensed out of the same uh, disk of dust and gas and, and, and stuff. And so they got the same recipe sort of from the beginning, right? They got from our sun their recipe for stuff. And we can see that Mars and the Earth are somewhat similar. And so we might imagine that the rocky, rocky moons could also be similar and have phosphorus present. But we don't know but, for sure. But that phosphorus also will be underwater, right? It should be coming from the rocks at the floor of that ocean. And the model that I showed, and I didn't go into the detail, we assume that there's some phosphorus from the rocks at the bottom of the ocean. It's not like there's zero phosphorus, there's just a lot less. 
So Rukmini asks, what about Enceladus? It has heat and organic stuff and salt in the underwater oceans. Yeah, I think Enceladus is super exciting. Um, what we're gonna ha- what we're gonna have trouble with for Enceladus is that in the near term, we're gonna send. Actually, I don't know if we have an Enceladus. We're gonna go to Europa first, right, with Europa Clipper, um, and we're gonna look at plumes, and so we're gonna see what comes out of those oceans, and we're gonna measure a little bit of inorganic stuff and a lot of organic chemistry, and so now we gotta figure out how to do geology based on organic chemistry, and detect life based on organic chemistry. We do experiments in my lab where we ask questions about what happens in hot water with rocks to organic compounds. And that's gonna be the kind of information we need to interpret the signals we get from probes that go to those moons. Eventually, a probe would be awesome, right? Figure out how to melt through the ice and go measure directly stuff in that ocean. But that's a long way off. So there is another question. Could the water pick up chemicals and different elements directly from the atmosphere? Oh, good question. So I focused on phosphorus because phosphorus is the big problem. It comes from the rocks. But plankton, they know how to get carbon out of the atmosphere, right, from CO2. And some kinds of of organisms know how to get nitrogen out of the atmosphere. They do what's called nitrogen fixation. They take the N2 that is in the atmosphere and they turn it into nitrate and ammonia. And so organisms have gotten very clever about getting stuff out of the atmosphere. For phosphorus, the problem is, is at least on Earth, there's no gas form for phosphorus. So yeah, if there's, the atmosphere is definitely a good source for some things, but because phosphorus is tied up in the rocks, it has a different geological history that make it problematic for my story. So, uh, Anna Jali says she has been researching RNA and the way life form and has a couple of questions, but never asked the questions. Uh, <laughs> ask the question, please. So the origin of RNA is really tricky, right? That is a huge question in sort of the origin of life and the evolution of life. Um, and there's two, Oh, she asked a question later on. Could it come from geological processes? Uh, Okay. There's kind of two camps in the world. There's the RNA first people who believe that RNA formed inorganically, geochemically, and that life kind of took it because it was useful. And there's the RNA second form, which is people that said, who, who think complex organic molecules form, life evolves, and then creates a more complex molecule known as RNA. Um, They come from amino acids, but we don't really understand if, we don't really know how it happened. And have you guys heard about the the, uh, Yuri Miller experiment? They did it in the 1950s where they, they put ammonia and CO2 and an electric shock into a bottle and they got or got molecules. We know that that can happen, but if you think about it, it's a pretty crazy set of circumstances to have to have happen over and over again to make biomolecules. Um, I think, and this is my opinion based on what I know about geochemistry, all the fancy reactions that we think about in say, uh, the respiratory pathways that make big molecules out of small molecules most of that can happen inorganically at high temperatures. So I tend to believe that the complex molecules formed in hydrothermal systems and that somehow magically, and I'm waving my hands, uh, primitive cells formed and some, and this is where I don't know how it works. I don't know how we got to self-replication. I don't think anybody knows that. Um, But it's a, sort of origin of life and whether life exists in other places are both part of astrobiology. I don't worry too much about how it got started. I assume it got started for us and so that it probably could get started someplace else. And I don't worry about how it got there. I just wanna know what it's gonna look like when we see it. Um, But we definitely need people to do the research on how it got there, how it started. 
So um, several questions here. Um, now says, so is it possible for us to try to recreate life? Um, there are certainly people whose research labs are all about that. Um, the Miller-Urey experiment was a first step. Um, there are people who are attempting to build templating experiments where minerals help to fix what shapes of molecules come in. Um, it's, a, it's really complicated chemistry. It's cool. Um, so was the early Earth considered a water world? Ah. A pelagic world? So you mean before the continents formed? Yes. Um, if the definition is based on the presence of continents, then you could say yes. Um, if the definition is based on the percent mass of water for mass of planet, probably not, because the Earth has never had a lot of water. We're actually pretty dry. It's just that our water is mostly at the surface in an ocean. Um, so can there be an alternative for phosphorus? Can some other chemical be used instead? Ah, always a good question. Um, you know, life was really very clever when it chose phosphorus. There's not a lot of elements that do what phosphorus can do, right? It's a real stable molecule that forms these stable bonds with oxygen to make phosphate. And so there's a few things that can make, make oxides, right? Aluminum and sulfur and all kinds of, and those kinds of things. It has a shape and a size that bonds really well with carbon molecules. And so sulfur can do that, but aluminum doesn't so much. The one that everybody sort of points at is arsenic, which has very similar structure to phosphorus, except that arsenic is super toxic. That's a downside. Um, so at least on our current earth and on our past earth, we have no evidence that anything has ever used anything but phosphorus and phosphate for DNA and RNA and for energy. Is it possible that other planets could have life that chose a different way? Sure, it's possible. But I couldn't tell you what to look for under those conditions. So people ask about arsenic. Could it be non-toxic to other things that are actually based on arsenic? It's poisonous to so, the life as we know it. So but now could... we're starting to speculate, right? Um, if something evolved to use it, and I don't mean like just got used to it, right? Build up a tolerance. I mean actually evolved to use that molecule and not this molecule. It could be fine. Um, but one of the problems with arsenic for us is that it, uh, it impedes the processes that we need for DNA production and replication, and it impedes the processes for energy. So it kind of fits like a lock and key, but not quite. Um, and so it's, uh, and even in places on earth where there is very high arsenic, right? And there are natural environments that have high arsenic. Um, life didn't choose to use it. Um, and so I think arsenic is what we call a red herring. It's an argument that people raise that say, oh, but it could have been like this because it's similar to phosphorus. But in reality, there's no evidence, no scientific evidence that it ever did. And so it's easy to say, oh, this element is similar, therefore maybe it could be done that way. But until we have some demonstration that, it's, that it could happen, it's hard to say anything except maybe. Although I think probably not, at least for Earth. Biochemistry is interesting. Um, biochemistry is really clearly derived from geochemistry, earth chemistry. And I have a colleague and he says, we have our biochemistry because the earth allows it, right? The thermodynamics, the laws of chemistry based on pressure and temperature and composition and the proportions of elements that are available are what allowed our biochemistry to evolve the way it did. Right, the planet came first, biology came second, but pretty fast, early in the Earth's history, and it 
built biology out of the chemistry of the planet. And so I do think knowing the chemistry of the planets is going to be really important because their life is going to evolve on their planet, not our planet. Does that make sense? Uh, absolutely, yes. Thank you so much. Uh, it, it's about time, actually. We have one more minute. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Interesting comments and in chat. <laughs> You know, yes. it's funny, it's after lots and lots of years of teaching and working with students on different projects and being excited about research questions on Earth and now about other planets, you have to be really open to ask the question. Don't be afraid to ask the question, but be prepared to not know the answers. Be prepared to have to, you know, ask a colleague who knows more than you do about stars or learn something about biology, even though that wasn't what you studied in school. And it, it's not necessarily about being smart. It's about being willing to learn. And for exoplanets, we know almost nothing. And so there's a lot to learn. And a great way to ask questions. Astrobiology lets us ask all types of questions and see how everything interconnects and how we can collaborate with each other. I, I like uh, Nayor's comment that school is a little dumb about biology. You know, I'm teaching a class called Habitable Worlds, which meets a 100 level introductory science requirement for non-science majors. And we teach it about this idea of what are the potentials for habitable planets? And people take it instead of introductory biology or introductory chemistry. And every one of them says, how come we never learn about this? And I think it's partly that, you know, being a school science teacher is hard. You have to stay on top of lots and lots of information. You might get stuck having to teach specific things because your school district requires it. Um, and many teachers, you know, if they're older teachers, they didn't know there were planets. We didn't know there were planets when I was in school around other stars. And so it's really challenging to sort of always have a school curriculum that knows all the new stuff. That's why this is such a cool thing for you guys, right? And the other thing to remember is that after you get out of, out of middle school and high school, you can study anything you want in college right? And everything you've learned so far will set you up for whatever it is that you want to study that's new. I hope we will actually get astrobiology in school someday. So we have at Arizona State University an undergraduate major in astrobiology. Um, and that's cool. And we also have a brand new online undergraduate degree in uh, astrophysical and planetary sciences. So it's starting to be starting to be much more out there in the in the school in the it's in the college curriculum and I think it'll get there to the junior colleges and the high schools. A Blue Marble Space Institute of Science is actually thinking about bringing more astrobiology to high school and undergrad students as well. Yeah. From what I've heard. I think it's a really exciting way to link biology and chemistry, um, which oftentimes in high school are a little hard to wrap your head around. Well, thank you so much. Some people say they're too young to go to college, but that's why we're doing this now, right? That's why. You'll yeah, get yeah, there. Yes. You'll definitely get there. That's why we're doing all these webinars and lectures, just to let you know what is out there. There are so many things that we don't know yet, and they're absolutely mm -hmm. amazing. And everyone will have, you know, something fun to explore. Yet, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much.
You're very welcome. And thank you everybody for your good questions. And I'm really glad you liked it.